Hi everyone, welcome back to my tutorial channel. Today we are going to talk about option tricks. And in this video, I'm going to first introduce the six Greek letters Delta, Gamma, Theta, Vega, Rho, and Psi. Then I'm going to talk about elastic city, sharp ratio, risk premium, option pricing approximation using option Greeks and some examples. Uh, the targets of this lesson is first compute and interpret option Greeks letter Delta, Gamma, Theta, Vega, Rho, and Psi. Compute the elastic city, the sharp ratio, the risk premium for both an individual option, call and put, and a portfolio consistent of both options of multiple types in the underlying stock. Uh, number three, to approximate option using Delta, Gamma, and Theta. All right, so before we go into these three um, main points, let's take a look at uh, the Black Skull framework. In the Black Skull framework, the price of any derivative security depends on the properties of the stock, the option, and the market environment. Uh, so the price of any derivative depends on three factors, stock, option, and environment. For the stock, it depends on three factors. The current stock price, S of T, the volatility, sigma, and the dividend yield rate, delta. The option feature depending on the time and the payout feature. And the environment depends on the risk-free interest rate, RF. You see for the price, we use V to denote the price of a derivative attempt T. And uh, V here depends on two variables, S and T. So we write V as a function of S and T. Here S is a current stock price and T is the time where we consider the price of the derivative. As time proceeds, we see that T would increase um, and S would change. So that's why V is the function of S and T. For example, for a power contract, the price of the derivative at time T V S at T is S to the power A E to the minus R plus A times R minus delta plus 0.5 A times A minus 1 sigma square. The whole thing times T minus T. Uh, remember that um, in the last lesson, we usually consider it the time frame zero. That's why here we have capital T instead of T minus little, uh, little T. But here we consider a general case at any time T. So let's say capital T is the duration length. And T is the time where we consider the derivative. So the time to expiration date is capital T subtract little t. So that's how we have capital T minus little t in here. For a castle northern European car, we got VST is equal to e to the minus r capital T minus little t phi d2. This is capital phi. The capital phi here represents for the CDF function of the standard normal distribution. In this lesson, you're going to see there are two phi. There are three phi in this lesson. One phi is in the capital. The other phi in the, um, the non-capital one. And another phi look like this, but represent for the sharp ratio. Alright, so for this Black Scholes Frameworks, 
Once we decide these six factors, S of T, Sigma, Delta T, payoff features, and RF, we wondering how to measure the sensitivity of V. Because if we can measure the sensitivity of V, we basically can uh, evaluate the risk of the derivative. So here we see that V is a function that depends on six factors, six variables right now, S of T, Sigma, Delta T, payoff features, RF. So basically we are going to differentiate V respect to these variables in order to consider the sensitivity of V. Uh, to be more specific, basically we want to see how a little change in each of these six uh, factor would affect V. Uh, this is why we have to use the rates of change. Alright, so let's consider delta, gamma, and theta. Um, these are basically the derivative of the price of the uh, derivative. Remember that V depends on five variables, S, um, T, Sigma, Delta, and R. So first we differentiate V respect to variable S, we got Delta. Then if we differentiate twice, I mean differentiate V respect to S twice, we will have Gamma. And if we differentiate V respect to T, then we have theta. So basically, delta here measure the change in V when there is a little change in S. Gamma measure the change in delta when there is a little change in S. And theta measure the change in V when there is a little change in T. You see that, so delta is equal to delta V, partial differentiate uh, of V respect to S, measures the change in the price V when the stock price S increased by $1. Gamma measure the change in delta when the stock price S increased by $1. And theta measure the change in the price V when there is a decrease in the time to expiration, there is an increase in T at T as capital T is fixed. Remember here T is the time that we consider the derivative and capital T is the duration length of the derivative. So the time to expiration is just the distance between T and little t. Now let's consider some properties of these three measures. For delta, um, for, for a car, delta should be positive and bounded by e to the minus delta capital T minus little t. For a put, delta should be negative and bounded by minus e to the minus delta capital T minus little t. If an option is deeply out uh, out at money, out of money, then delta should be approximately zero. If it's deeply in the money, then we got delta should be very close to either minus e to the minus delta t minus t or plus e to the minus delta t minus t. The reason for this is when a, uh, a security is OTM, is really unlikely to be exercised. So the price of it, you see, close to zero. And delta is just the derivative of V respect to S, so it should be close to zero. And when it's deeply ITM, then um, depending on whether it's a car or put, then delta is the first derivative of the price of the derivative respect to S should go close to uh, e to the minus delta t minus t or minus e to the minus delta t minus t. And for the 
ITM, the in the money, the payoff should be plus or minus S minus K, and it should be non-zero. Because uh, the payoff here for the call option, it should be S minus K, and for the put option, it should be K minus S. So, and also because for ITM, V is really large, it's not zero. So, we got the payoff should not be zero. Gamma. For a long position of, of cars and put, gamma should be positive. Because V is positive. And when we consider the second group, it should be positive. So European cars and put are its convector roots. Because remember, gamma here, the second group of the V function. So when gamma is positive, V is a convex function. That means European cars and puts are convex derivatives. If the derivative is either deeply OTM or ITM, then gamma should be zero. For theta, you see theta is negative. Uh, if an option is deeply OTM, then theta is very close to zero. Because, of course, when it's OTM, then V is very close to zero, because it's unlikely to be as a side. So the first derivative of V respect to T is very close to zero. If it's deeply ATM, theta is large and negative. Now we consider the last three Greek letters. Vega, Psi, and Rho. Actually, Vega in some textbook is called Var Theta, not Vega, but uh, for short we call it Vega. Um, so for the Vega, Psi, and Rho, we basically differentiate with respect to the other three factors, Sigma, Delta, and R. Sigma is the volatility of the stock. Delta is the dividend yield rate and R is the risk free interest rate. So you see that just by the formula, Vega is delta V over delta sigma. That means the partial differentiate of V respect to sigma. And this measure the change in Vega, the change in V in the price V. When there is a little change in sigma, the volatility of the stock the underlying stock. Um, this one is Psi. Psi measure the change in the price when there is a little change in the dividend yield rate. And Rho measure the change in V when there is a little change in the risk free interest rate. So Vega measure the change in the price V when the volatility sigma increase by one unit. Psi measure the change in V when the continuous dividend yield rate delta increased by one unit. And rho measure the change in V when the risk free interest rate increased by one unit. For Vega, for long call and long put, Vega is always positive. Because sigma is um, uh, on the, f you can you can prove it by taking a, uh, a look at some v function and try to differentiate it. You can see that for long term long call and long put, Vega is always positive. Vega tend to be greater for ATM option and greater for option with longer time to expiration. This can be proved using the formula to differentiate respect to sigma, and then you can see it. Psi. Psi is negative for cars and positive for puts. Rho. Rho is opposite to psi. Rho is positive for cars, but negative for puts. All right. Now let's consider this example. Calculate the time t, delta, gamma, theta, vega, Psi and Rho for a cash or nothing call. 
Uh, in this view, I'm going to just calculate four of them because the last two are easy and you can just follow the rule. So in this view, I'm going to calculate the time t delta, gamma, theta, and rho. All right. So before we do anything, let's recall a cash or nothing call price function. The price function for a cash or nothing call is VST, which is equal to e to the minus r times capital T minus little t phi of d2. Remember that here we use capital T minus t because we consider a time t, not time zero. T represents for the time where we consider the derivative, and capital T represents for the duration length. Phi here, this is capital phi. You see, there is a difference between this capital phi and this phi. You see that this phi is not uh, capital. The capital phi represents the CDF of the um, normal uh, standard normal distribution, and this regular phi represents for just the PDF of the standard normal distribution. Here, D2 is natural log of s over k minus r minus delta minus sigma square over 2 times t minus little t over sigma square of t minus little t. This formula is a little bit different from the d2 in the last video because in the last video we consider time 0. At time 0, s is s0 and t minus t is just t. But here for general, in the general case, we consider a time t, that means t minus t to the expiration day, uh, and we got this d2. And uh, before we differentiate v with respect to the five factors, five variables, we first need to know the first derivative of phi and the, the first derivative of uh, um, the regular phi. So here, capital phi represents the CDF. So of course, the first derivative of the CDF is the PDF. And uh, in standard normal distribution, little phi of z here, this the PDF, this is the PDF, is 1 over square root of 2 pi e to the minus z square over 2, um, assuming that z here is a variable. Uh, z is uh, the value of the standard normal distribution. And now we do another step. We know that the first derivative of capital phi is regular phi. Now what about the first derivative of the regular phi? Since regular phi z is equal to 1 over square root of 2 pi e to the minus z square over 2, if we, if we differentiate it, we have to use chain rule, and we got phi prime z is minus z over square root of 2 pi e to the minus z square over 2, because that first derivative of minus z square over 2 is minus z. That's why we got minus z in the front as a factor right here. And we notice that the first derivative of regular phi is just minus z times phi. So we notice two more things here. The first derivative of the capital phi is the little phi or the regular phi. Then the first derivative of the regular phi is just minus z times regular phi. See that? So with this information, now we can be confident. We can be confident to differentiate v respect to these variables using some um, differentiation rules like chain rules, uh, product rules, quotient rule, um, reciprocal rules, blah blah blah. All right. So let's consider the first one, time t delta. Remember that delta is the first derivative of v respect to s, and here of course we are using partial differentiation because the function is multiple, uh, multi variables. So here you see v here is e to the minus r capital T minus little t phi d two, uh, and if you di differentiate its respect to s, we see that the first factor e to the minus r times t minus little t. Uh, doesn't have any s in it, so we can treat it as just a, a constant. Now for the second factor phi, capital phi of d2, here d2 is a function of s because in d2 formula we see natural s over k, right? 
So basically, this is a composite function. So when you differentiate phi respect to s, we have to use chain rule. We have to use chain rule. So here, now we let perform it. The, fir the first factor e to the minus r times t minus t is a constant. So we basically just bring outside and I mark it with a red color right here. Now for this, the phi of d2, when we differentiate, we need to use power rule. So we first differentiate, uh, differentiate phi respect to d2 and then differentiate d2 respect to s. That's why we got phi prime of d2. Here this is capital phi. And the partial differentiate uh, of d2 respect to s. Now I'm going to rewrite red, the red color because there's nothing changed in the red color. Now for the purple color, the capital phi derivative is just the little phi or the regular phi. You see that? Now for the partial differentiate, uh, the partial differentiation of d2 respect to s, we basically just if we look at this, if we look at d2, we can treat anything after the minus sign right here as a constant, and after the first group is cancel out. So we just have to pay attention to natural of s or k over sigma square of t minus little t. So to do the um, basic differentiation rule, we got this green color. This green color represents for this green. This purple is equal to this purple. And this red is equal to this red. See that? Now we can cancel out k with k and then try to rewrite everything. So delta here is e to the minus r capital T minus little t phi of d2. Remember this is regular phi over s sigma times t minus little t. Now the color uh, no longer matters. So we can change them all to black color. So this is the formula for delta for a cast or nothing call. Now for gamma, remember gamma is the second derivative of v and is also the first derivative of delta. So instead of like redo the differentiation at the first time, we basically can just differentiate delta. And uh, here we got delta is this formula, right? So delta, um, differentiate delta respect to s, we see that there is some uh, factor that we can treat at constant. The red and the blue right here we can treat, uh, excuse me, is not, it should be this one, the red and sigma t minus t can be bring outside as a constant. Now we differentiate phi of d2 over s respect to s and we basically just use quotient rule because this is a quotient. So uh, bring all the constant down. Now for the quotient rule, we have to uh, square the denominator. Now the first derivative of phi d2 is just phi prime of d2 times with the partial differential of d2 respect to s times with the denominator s and then minus the first derivative of the denominator is 1 times what the numerator is 5d2. And then remember that the first derivative of d2 here, the first derivative of 5d2 here is just minus d2 5d2. And partial differentiate of uh, these two respect to s is just one over s is cancel out with this s. That's why you no longer see s on the numerator right here. And then just simplify, we got this is the time t gamma of the function. See that? Now let's consider time t theta. The time t theta. We differentiate v respect to t. So now if we observe delta of uh, theta, we see in v, in v, both two factors have um, t, little t in it. e to the minus r t minus t have t in it, and d2 also have t in it. So we have to use product rule for this. First, we differentiate e to the minus r t minus little t. We got r t 
time e to the minus t minus r t minus t time with phi d2 and then we differentiate phi d2 you see that and remember d2 here is a function of t so we have to use chain rule and we got uh, partial differentiate d2 respect to t at the end right here you see that and now for the first term which is rewrite the first term the second term phi prime of d2 is um, this is capital phi so the first of capital phi is just little phi you see that d2 phi is different you see that and partial differential d2 respect to t we basically just have to do the quotient rule it's a little bit long but if you spend time to work it out little by little you will have the same answer with mine all right if you uh, want to verify this just work on and take a piece of paper and work on yourself and then compare okay you can stop my video anytime now for psi psi is um, the further of v respect to delta and here we see that uh, this one is a very easy one because the first factor doesn't have any delta in it only d2 contain delta and delta here is just a linear d2 is a linear function of delta is so it's very easy to differentiate d2 respect to delta so first for the content e to the minus r t minus liberty i just rewrite here then capital phi derivative and then the derivative of d2 respect to delta capital phi derivative is little phi derivative uh, little phi and then the derivative the respect to delta is t minus liberty t over sigma square of t minus liberty t and then to derive it we got one over sigma e to the minus r t minus t phi d2 times square root of t minus liberty all right now let's talk about elastic city we use elastic city omega to measure the change in volatility sv in the price of the rip over a change in the stock volatility so basically we try to make connection between the volatility in the stocks and the volatility in the derivative and we have a relation that the uh, sv is equal to omega times sigma where sigma is the underlying stock volatility and sv is the volatility of the price in a derivative and omega here is measured by s delta over v remember s is the stock price the current stock price delta is uh, the first derivative of uh, v respect to s and v is uh, the price in uh, the price of the derivative the expected return of the derivative mv is s delta over v times alpha plus 1 minus s delta over v times r and is equal to omega alpha plus 1 minus omega r alpha here is the total expected return of the stock and r is the risk free rate Financial interpretation of elastic city um, just by the formula SV is equal to omega sigma. If we take the absolute value both sides, we got absolute value SV is equal to absolute value omega times sigma. Sigma is positive by itself, so you don't need the absolute value. If the absolute value of omega is greater than 1, then the absolute value of the SV is greater than sigma. And the option is riskier, uh, riskier than the underlying assets because you remember that volatility is a measure of risk. So if um, if omega's absolute value is greater than one, that means the volatility of the derivative is greater than the volatility of the stock. So it should be riskier. Additionally, if we consider rho is equal um, omega is equal to s delta over v uh, delta here is partial differentiation of v respect to s 
And now if we rewrite delta V over V and delta S over S, we basically, we basically have a ratio between two rates of change, right? Uh, Thus, the elasticity is the bosonic change in the derivative price relative to uh, the bosonic change in the stock price. All right. Now we consider a sharp ratio and risk premium. Remember, in the very very first lessons, we got sharp ratio is calculated by the risk premium over the volatility, and the risk premium is the total expected return subtract the risk free rate over the volatility and for a stock remember we use phi here phi is not standard normal distribution okay phi here is the sharp ratio phi is equal to alpha minus r over sigma alpha is the total expected return of the stock r is the risk-free rate and sigma is the volatility now if we consider for an option with the rip we got phi here representing for uh, the sharp ratio and it's equal to MV minus R over SV because MV is the total expected return for the roof and SV is the volatility of the derivative. R is the risk-free rate, is a constant, so we don't need V for it. Um, application to corporate uh, finance. Let RS and RMKT be the time T instantaneous, continuously compounded random rate a return on a non-dividend paying stock in the market portfolio. So RS is for the non-dividend paying stock in the market portfolio is MKT. Then we got expected return of the non-dividend paying stock is just the total expected return alpha of the underlying stock. Expected return of uh, the market portfolio is just the total expected return of the market portfolio. Alpha here is the total expected return of the stock, and alpha MKT is the expected return of the market portfolio. Uh, remember that we got the expected return of the um, derivative is equal to omega times alpha plus 1 minus omega times r. That means you can understand this basically, it's just like MV is a, a combination of alpha and r. And um, omega and one minus omega represent for the weight. Of course, the total of the weight should be one, right? And now, if we uh, subtract both sides by r, we got mv minus r is equal to omega times alpha minus r. And now, if we divide both sides by um, alpha mkt minus r then we got beta beta right mv minus r over alpha mkt minus r is the beta v that means the beta of the that's the beta of the derivative and alpha minus r over alpha mkt minus r is beta of the underlying stock so we got a new formula that beta v is equal to omega beta all right now let's consider the Plexco's equation. The Plexco's equation is partial differential of v respect to t plus r minus delta times s times partial differential of v respect to s plus one half sigma square s where the second derivative of v respect to s is equal to r times v. And remember delta v over delta t is delta uh, is theta. Delta V over Delta S is Delta. Delta square of V over Delta S square is Gamma. So we have two formulas of the Plexco's equation. Now let's consider Delta Gamma approximation. Remember that by Taylor expansion, here let's consider if we consider T is a fixed variable and if we consider it only one time T. Of the fit time t and let's say the stock price is uh, different by epsilon so by Taylor expansion we got vs of um, v of s plus t um, excuse me v of s plus epsilon t is approximately v of st plus vs at t 
epsilon plus one half vs s at t epsilon square. Here vs represents for the first derivative of v respect to s, and vs s represents for the second derivative of v respect to s. This is by Taylor expansion. And s t in the parentheses here represents for the variable of v. So this is how we write the delta gamma approximation. Remember that the first derivative vs here is delta and vss is gamma. So we got vs plus epsilon t is approximately v at t plus delta epsilon plus one half gamma epsilon square. And now let's consider a more complicated case when both s and t change. So here let's say there's a little change in t. Of course, s depends on t. So when t changes, s also changes. That's why we consider h as a um, um, the difference in t. So s sub t plus h is the stop right at the time t plus h. So we see that both s and t change, right? So when we consider the Taylor expansion, we have to uh, take into account both variables. So we got v of t t plus delta epsilon plus one half gamma epsilon square plus theta h, where epsilon here is a different in the stock price over time. All right. So these are um, the uh, some formulas to uh, approximate the option price. Now we got some. Uh, additional result, the Crick identity. Here we got S of T it is current stock price, K it is try, right? So at T time E to the minus delta times T minus little t phi D1 is equal to K time E to the minus R T minus little t phi D2. Here phi here is a regular phi, it's just the PDF of the standard normal distribution. Uh, when we consider European cars and puts in the black coast models for the cars, we got delta is e to the minus delta t minus t phi d1. In gamma is this put, we got delta is minus e to the minus delta t minus little t phi minus d1. These four formula can be proved using uh, the uh, V function for European cars and put. Remember for car it should be S minus K and for put it should be K minus S. That's why for car there's no minus sign here but for put there's a minus sign here. You see that? Before yours of the roots. Consider before you would end the roof on the same underlying stock S. The value of the before your is P. P here represents for the price of the portfolio. It is equal to summation of WIVI. That, that is the weighted mean of the um, the price of the derivative. Here we call VI is the price of the end derivative and WI is the weight of the end derivative. Now in order to find delta, we differentiate both sides respect to S. Uh, Wi here is a constant. It doesn't have anything with s, so we treat it as a uh, we treat Wi as constants. So we differentiate Vi respect to s, and different uh, delta Vi over delta s is just delta i. So we got delta of the portfolio is is the weighted mean of the delta of the underlying stocks. All right, let's consider example two. Assume that the black coal framework holds. Uh, the price of a non-dividend paying stock is $40. The price of a put option on the stock is $5. You are given that delta is minus 0 0.24 and gamma is 0 0.14. Using the delta gamma approximation, determine the price of the put option if the stock price change to 42.15. This is a very easy problem. All we have to do is just follow the formula. And before we do it, let's notice that epsilon here is the change in uh, the stock price. So we take the 42.15, subtract the original price, 40. We got 2.15. Now use the uh, delta gamma approximation. We got Vs plus delta 
uh, excuse me, v of s plus epsilon t is approximately v at t plus delta epsilon plus one half gamma epsilon square. Here, there's no theta because we we consider at only one time t. We don't consider different time t. So there's no change in t. All right. So v of at t here is the price, right? And it's given, delta is given, epsilon with 2.15, gamma is given. So we got Vs plus epsilon t here is 40 subtract 0 0.24 times 2.15 plus 1 half times 0.14 times 2.15 squared. We got 39.81. And this is the price of the put option. Alright. Alright, so that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.